More than a million Americans are in prison tonight, which means, among other things, that we imprison more of our countrymen than any other nation in the world. But that's not the only noteworthy thing about our prison population. All inmates, no matter what they're in prison for, are entitled to adequate food, housing, and the same kind of medical care they would have gotten on the outside. That's the law. But complaints are growing not just from inmates, but from prison doctors, that medical treatment in prison is woefully lacking, and that even a minor jail term can turn out to be a death sentence. There are 65,000 inmates in the overcrowded federal prison system, spread around the country at 66 institutions. Before you ask why you should care about a bunch of prisoners, it's important to remember one thing. Not everyone in federal prison is a criminal. On any given day, there are 4,000 inmates in federal custody, people who are awaiting trial, people who haven't been convicted of anything. In November of 1987, one of them was a 41-year-old single mother named Isabel Suarez. Isabel Suarez was arrested on a federal assault charge after she got into a fight with her mail carrier about the delivery of her welfare check. The crime carried a maximum penalty of 90 days in jail and a $100 fine. Isabel Suarez was brought from her home in northern Michigan to the Metropolitan Correctional Center, the federal jail, here in Chicago. She had a medical problem. Isabel Suarez was an epileptic, and without her anti-seizure medication, she would go into convulsions. That medication was confiscated when she was brought here to Chicago. Georgina Lawson was an inmate at the Metropolitan Correction Center when Isabel Suarez arrived. She um, started getting seizures one after another. She started biting her tongue and foaming through her mouth. According to medical records, the prison staff thought Isabel was faking. Attention-seeking behavior, they called it. So they locked down Isabel Suarez, isolating her in her cell, where she continued to have seizures. Desperate, Georgina Lawson got to a prison payphone and called 911. The ambulance had came, but they didn't leave them in the building. Prison officials wouldn't let him in? No. It was only after a week when Isabel Suarez went into a coma and was taken to a local hospital that she was finally examined by a doctor. In the meantime, the prosecutor decided to drop all charges against her. Two weeks later, Isabel Suarez died. It is always tragic and unfortunate when something of that sort occurs. Dr. The, uh, Kenneth Moritsugu, who's wearing the uniform of the Public Health Service, is the head of health services for the U.S. Bureau of Prisons. We asked Dr. Moritsugu about an investigation that he ordered into the death of Isabel Suarez that resulted in this report. And I quote, in my opinion, the medical care provided to Mrs. Suarez during her incarceration in the MCC was abysmal. I understand what you're saying. And what I am... Not what I'm saying, it's what your own doctor is saying. Well, again, I don't feel that I can quote or comment further on that report. Do you think the care that she received was adequate? I think the care that she received balanced the care and custody issues that we were concerned with. I think that obviously in retrospect one may think and make other professional judgments, but at that point that was a professional judgment. You have to forgive me, it, it, it didn't seem to balance very well for Isabel Suarez. She's dead. And the charges against her were later dropped. I really don't feel that I can comment further on that. As we said, every federal inmate is entitled to quality medical care, even at the Marion Federal Prison, the top security penal institution in the United States, housing 435 of the nation's most dangerous convicts. One of those convicts was this man, Alan Berkman. For 10 years, the only doctor at Marion Prison has been an unlicensed general practitioner. What do you mean an unlicensed physician? He hasn't got a license to he practice medicine? He has no medicine? license to practice medicine. In fact, inmate Alan Berkman is a licensed doctor, the only licensed doctor while he was in Marion prison. Dr. Berkman was sent to Marion to serve a 12-year sentence after being convicted of conspiracy in an explosives case. Arrested in 1985, Dr. Berkman was classified a high-security inmate because he was linked to a violent radical group. After he arrived at Marion, Dr. Berkman suspected that he had developed a reoccurrence of a cancer and went to see that unlicensed prison doctor. First time he saw me, he asked me what blood test should he order, 
what x-rays should he order, and would I examine the x-rays? What do you think your condition would be if you weren't a doctor? I think I'd be dead. The health care that is provided within the federal system does not require that a physician, in fact, be licensed. But if you're a physician, you go to medical school, you want to practice medicine in the United States, you need a license, right? In the private sector, yes. And unlike in the private sector, when you're a prisoner, you have no choice when it comes to who your doctor is, what treatment you get, or where you can go for medical care. This is the flagship of the Bureau of Prisons Health Care System, the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. It's where thousands of federal inmates with serious medical problems are sent for treatment. It used to be part of a private estate. From the highway, it could pass for a college campus. But among some federal prisoners, it's known as the death house. For me, it became a matter of life and death to not go to Springfield. Dr. Alan Berkman requested that he be treated in another federal prison hospital, which had a good track record of dealing with his kind of cancer. But the Bureau of Prisons insisted that because he was a high security prisoner, he had to go to Springfield. We know that if not equipped to treat me, I'll die there. They said, we're going to send you anyhow. Dr. Kenneth Spangler was head of health services at the Springfield Prison Hospital. Dr. Berkman said, you sent me to Springfield, you're giving me the death sentence. He's wrong. So you're saying he would have gotten just as good a care here? Probably gotten as good, if not better. Dr. Berkman says he decided to fight for his life in federal court to stop his transfer to Springfield. A federal judge agreed with him. There was a federal judge in the case that disagrees with you. He said that the care he would have gotten here would have been inadequate. Where did the federal judge get his medical degree? Attracting doctors and surgeons who can perform difficult operations, specialists like chest surgeons and urologists, has always been a problem for the federal prisons, and Springfield Hospital in particular. And prison doctors performing surgery that they would not be permitted to do in community hospitals has led to allegations of unnecessary death and disfigurement. Well, you hear about they taking the guy's wrong leg off and this type of stuff, and the guys dying on the operating table. But I, I never paid attention to that because I didn't believe it. Ronnie Holly was convicted of falsifying federal firearm registration forms and sentenced to five years in a federal prison in Texas. Well, I noticed small growth on my penis, and I felt around and felt one in my lower stomach. Then an inmate, Ronnie Holly, was transferred to the Springfield Federal Prison Hospital for treatment. Holly says he was told that the gross would be removed by a specialist, a urologist, brought in from the outside community, and that it would be a simple procedure involving a one-inch incision. But when I woke up, I was cut. I don't know how many stitches I had in me. 30 or 40 stitches I was cut in my penis and on my lower stomach. Some say I was filleted, you know, like you would fillet a fish. Some use the word butchered. An outside urologist at the University of Texas examined Ronnie Holly after the operation and concluded that the surgery was unsatisfactory from both a functional and a cosmetic standpoint. They took my manhood. I was 32 years old when this happened. And the way the surgery was performed, I, my manhood is gone. The doctor who performed that operation on Ronnie Holly was this man, prison doctor Leland Wetzel. We wanted to talk to him about that operation and others and about his qualifications to perform them. Dr. Wetzel refused to talk with us. So we asked his former boss, Dr. Spangler, about the Holly case. Yeah, I'm not a urologist, not even a surgeon. So uh, to comment on a uh, particular surgical technique there, uh, I think I'd be kind of stretching it. Was Dr. Wetzel qualified to perform the surgery? Uh, without knowing what the procedure, the actual procedure was, I no, I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Um, is he a urologist? No, he's not. He's a general surgeon. So you don't understand how Springfield works. I mean, you could be the chief of surgery at Springfield and never do any surgery. Dr. Dante Landucci is a prison doctor and is currently head of health services at the Bureau of Prisons Detention Center in Los Angeles. I think that the physicians at Springfield felt much the same way as some of the audience may. And that is, these are felons. Why are we worrying? Why are we wasting money? Why are we expending resources? Dr. Landucci used to work at the Springfield Prison Hospital with Dr. Patty Albright. I wouldn't want to be taken care of by the doctors at Springfield. Um, to call them substandard, 
I think they don't care very much about the patients. Doctors Albright and Landucci say they asked to be transferred out of Springfield after they were harassed by some of the medical staff because, they say, they tried to improve the quality of inmate medical care. There were some people who, who would label me an inmate lover because I tried to take standard medical care. Doctors Landucci and Albright say that some of the doctors at Springfield not only performed operations they weren't qualified to do, they say there was no effective system of peer review like the one that exists in hospitals on the outside, where doctors can criticize each other's performance, suggest improvements, even remove incompetent physicians. Doctors Landucci and Albright say it wasn't unusual for seriously ill patients to arrive at the Springfield Prison Hospital without their medical records. Another situation the doctors say that may have led to unnecessary deaths. I would acknowledge that there has been problems in the past with the uh, obtaining of medical records in some, in some cases. Michael Quinlan is the director of the U.S. Bureau of Prisons, the man in charge of all federal penitentiaries and prison hospitals. We have never refused to provide essential medical care for the absence of a record. So no, no problems have been exacerbated by our failure to have the medical records. That's certainly not what we've been told by doctors that we've talked to, both inside and outside the system who have worked in the facilities by Dr. Landucci, Dr. Albright. It's not a perfect world. I mean, these people I are agree. still working for I you. Know it. I know it. I know they work, and I'm proud to have them on our staff. I'm telling you that it is not a problem. It's, a, it's the kind of management problem that, as a, as a nationwide system of prison facilities, 66 facilities all feeding into different locations, it's a problem, and we're working on it. And the transportation of sick inmates from those 66 institutions to prison health facilities is also a problem. Shackled prisoners are moved from institution to institution by buses that pick up and drop off inmates along the way, a system they call diesel therapy. It's a prisoner misnomer. We do not use transportation as punishment. We've talked to people and seen cases where inmates traveling from the southeast part of the United States in Alabama, Georgia, would end up all the way in Nevada before coming back to Springfield, Missouri, uh, sometimes making four, five, six stops along the way. Sick people shackled to uh, a seat in the bus for eight hours a day. We transfer prisoners all the time. We transfer over 100,000 prisoners a year from institutions to institutions to take care of both medical care and, and security needs. And uh, if prisoners need urgent medical care, they're airlifted. If they don't, they're going to go by bus transportation. We've had lawyers that have come to us and, and inmates who have come to us and said that, and shown us cases that said that what they amount to is, is torture. That if you've got somebody who is sick, somebody who needs medical attention and is put on a bus and shipped from place to place to place to place to place, that that's, in fact, cruel and unusual punishment. You are making... There's nothing, there's nothing in the civilian population that you can compare that to. You are making out the Bureau of Prison staff as unsympathetic, uncaring people. Director Quinlan admits that balancing security and medical care is a difficult problem. Well, it's a, a very difficult job that I think we do pretty well. I don't... Uh, I think that there's been any cases that I've ever heard of where we have uh, not provided the necessary security and the necessary essential medical care. Not a single case? Not a single case. In fact, we found numerous cases involving inmates who prison personnel knew had serious life-threatening illnesses and nevertheless were shipped around the country in the prison bus system. And the Bureau of Prisons' own records reflect hundreds of complaints of inadequate medical care, like an inmate with a brain tumor who was ignored and then died another whose desperate pleas for help were neglected until he died in agony of cancer in solitary confinement, and of an incident involving chest surgery by an unqualified doctor in which the patient died. Every indication is that we provide comparable care than that, that which is available to the community, to law-abiding, tax-paying citizens. What about the Isabel Suarez case? Well, uh, the Isid uh, Isabel Suarez case is an example uh, that uh, I think points up the fact that you can't take a, a single case and characterize the entire be, uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, just as you couldn't in the community health care system on the basis of one case. So we asked him about the Ronnie Holly case. That's certainly unfortunate, absolutely unfortunate. But again, you can't characterize an entire prison system medical care system just like you can't characterize the entire community med medical care system on the basis of individual cases. So then we asked him about the case of Dr. Alan Berkman. Dr. Berkman committed a very serious offense to start with, but he received the appropriate medical care 
and obviously he's, he's still alive and kicking to tell you about it. Because of his court battle, Dr. Alan Berkman was given his cancer treatment at a public hospital outside the federal prison system. I have gotten decent medical care, but not from the federal prison system, in spite of the federal prison system. And what happened to Ronnie Holly? He was released from prison early. Parole officials concluded that he had suffered enough, both mentally and physically. And what happened to Dr. Leland Wetzel, the doctor who performed the surgery? He was promoted. He's now chief of surgery at the Springfield Prison Hospital. The United States Bureau of Prisons insists that it has thousands of inmates who were satisfied with the medical care that they've received in prison. And the government points to a study of eight of their 67 institutions, which concludes that prison health care is, quote, adequate. About that doctor practicing in prison without a license, the Bureau says he's been told to go out and get one.